We're discussing trauma during the COVID-19 pandemic next on City Corner. I'm Sarah Thompson and welcome to City Corner. On August 18th, We Rise Up for Kids is hosting a webinar focused on the treatment of COVID-19 traumas and beyond. We're gonna learn more about the details of the webinar later in the show, but before we have that discussion, we're gonna talk first with the featured speakers of the workshop about the trauma that is currently being experienced in our communities. I'm joined by Dr. Carrie Lewis, a licensed clinical psychologist based here in St. Louis, uh, and Dr. Alana, a trauma psychiatrist who is joining us from Houston. Thank you both for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. So I want to start off, uh, as I introduced uh, just at the start of the show, talk, we're talking about trauma and the pandemic, and we're going to get into sort of secondary trauma. But just to kick things off, I was looking at some, some stats and data, and I referenced something where it was the CDC prior to all of the pandemic was talking about more than half of US children have experienced some kind of trauma in their day-to-day -day lives, whether it be grief or poverty or family problems. And so here comes the pandemic and now we have stress and fear and uncertainty on top of that. So I wanna start things off with you, Dr. Carey, and just maybe tell people at home who are watching this, describe the trauma that's being experienced right now by children as a result of the pandemic. Uh, so it is definitely challenging for kids who don't understand uh, as much as adults or who are being uh, having things explained to them by adults who maybe don't understand fully themselves. Um, one key part of the trauma related to COVID is um, the uncertainty of how long will this last, um, what's going to happen with school, um, are we going to be okay, or is my family going to be okay, and those are questions that you know parents can't answer. Uh, so it's just a lot of um, confusion and kids really thrive with structure and routine and that's something that is not as available at this point. Um, and that's just for kids even in ideal circumstances. So if we talk about kids who are, um, you know, whether it be living in poverty or struggling, um, have family members that are struggling with substance abuse and mental health issues, um, it's compounded. Uh, because they're, you know, pretty helpless in, in that environment without their typical outlet. So, yeah. I've heard um, the term a lot thrown around where people are talking about collective trauma, and I'm trying to take a look here at my notes, but the term collective trauma, and how does that differ from, um, what's the difference between collective trauma and obviously individual trauma? And Dr. Alana, did you want to maybe speak to that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, I think that it's important to recognize that we are having a global trauma right now. Um, I, I define trauma as anything that is significantly painful enough or an, enough of a, a major change that it, it changes the way that you think about yourself, other people, and the world. And of course, we've had a gigantic shift in how we operate in part because there is a legitimate invisible threat um, to our safety. And then there's major changes in how, uh, how we are having to function. And that in itself, uh, rapid change that happens, you know, it was almost night and day, um, that is significantly challenging for people. So uh, individual trauma and collective trauma are similar in the fact that um, the, per the people it, it, of course, you can't have collective trauma without it affecting individuals. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes, you have your own personal um, story, but it's happening in the context of everyone around you being affected by similar circumstances. So honestly, I think one of the things that um, I hold on to in this space is that I know that trauma is treatable and that trauma can be healed. And so especially now that we can acknowledge that everyone is having trauma and that it's, there's no one really that's left out of that space, then I think we can destigmatize the idea that trauma is very prevalent in our society for a number of reasons and that we don't have to be ashamed about something that everyone is experiencing. And so I, I hear a lot of people saying, 
you know, sometimes I feel good. Sometimes I feel bad. Sometimes I'm ready to, to start my own business. And other <laughs> days I can't get out of the bed. <laughs> I'm crying in my, in, in my ice cream. Um, and so that you, people go, oh, you, why am I so tired all the time? Because we are experiencing trauma, but we don't have the language to describe how that actually feels and how that impacts your system biologically and psychologically. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate you giving, because my next question to follow up with that was really for parents what they should look for, but what you're describing is that high, low, high, low. And I know, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, a lot of adults have, have experienced that. I mean, I feel that myself. What should parents at home, what should they be aware of and what sort of exhibiting symptoms should they be looking for? Are they the same as you've just, just described? And you can both answer that, you know, if you'd like. I'll let Carrie do the kids and I'll do the adults. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it is definitely a lot of the same um, symptoms and things to look out for. Uh, some of the risk factors that are really prevalent right now are um, the sleep schedule being thrown off. So a lot of kids are staying up, you know, way past their typical um, bedtimes and not having routine. Um, and that, you know, is associated with a lot of mood issues and behavioral issues. Uh, so isolating um, even more than we're already being told to do um, is a concern. So for some people, they get kind of, they don't necessarily want to be home and alone, but it's also safe and feels more comfortable. And so they might be reluctant to go out even when it is in a safe um, way, manner. So that's something else. Um, yeah, tearfulness, uh, mood swings, irritability and anger is often um, more prevalent in younger kids. Um, and so any change in behavior um, is something to note, but I would say it's similar for adults. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sure. Alano, did you want to add to that? Sure. It's, I agree with Dr. Carey that it's a, it, it always is interesting to me when people think that adults and children are a whole lot different, but children may throw tantrums, but adults throw tantrums too, just in different <laughs> ways. And so uh, mood swings, outbursts irritability, um, changes in sleep patterns, um, insomnia for many people having difficulty turning their mind off, feeling anxious, maybe even having uh, panic episodes or episodes where they, uh, their heart starts beating fast, they might start sweating, they may feel chest pain, they may get headaches. Um, a lot of people are describing feeling um, uh, distracted, easily distracted, having difficulty keeping up with things and um, staying on target. And that makes sense because we're all having stress. We're, we all probably, if I could measure everyone's cortisol levels, which is our stress hormone, they would be higher. So that makes your mind foggy. That might make you have difficulty concentrating and difficulty carrying out things that previously were relatively simple for you. Um, but that also makes sense in the context of we have a legitimate thing that makes the, the, the things that were so simple, like going to the grocery store, now actually involve planning and involved a significant amount of more thought process in order to carry those things out because you can't just walk out the door. Now you need to have your, your mask, your hand sanitizer, your wipes, mm -hmm. your, you know, uh, a mm -hmm. strategy for what you're going to do when you get there and get out and how you're going to do that safely. And that is taxing. I think in our society, we have a tendency to undermine uh, or, or undervalue things that we can't see. And thinking is an energy burn. And so anytime that you have to do significantly more decision trees in your mind for activities that you have to do, it's going to pull more uh, energy and it's going to make you more tired. So I think uh, the, the symptoms in children and adults just remember the, the difference usually with kids is that they have even less opportunity to have awareness of what emotions they're feeling. So they're more likely to communicate it through their body than to be able to say, I'm feeling sad. I miss my friends. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, I wish that we were back in school or I don't really like being stuck in the house. Instead, you might just have one day where they, you know, blow up and all of a sudden you're like, what is wrong with them? Well, what's, what's wrong is that they're having emotions, that they're having difficulty communicating. But to be honest, adults are not that much better at recognizing the, their emotions. <laughs> we have no system 
that trains us about educate, education about emotions. It's not in our schools. It's definitely not good examples on our television and our media. Mm -hmm. And we're often taught that we're not supposed to have emotions or that we're not supposed to feel things or that men don't have them or that they make you weak or, you know, I could name a bunch of emotional myths, but that puts us at a significant disadvantage because when we're feeling normal things, related to these changes and these traumas that we're going through, then we add layers of self-judgment on it. Like I shouldn't be feeling this way. Right. I should be able to operate like I was before. Why am I not able to do the things that I could do before? And that's really unfair for everyone to be judging themselves against a bar that, that was previously there because we're in, diff we're in a different circumstance. Mm -hmm. Before we, um, you know, before we wrap for time, I did want to bring in, because I know that um, this is going to be addressed uh, a bit with the webinar, which is when you mentioned media, it kind of triggers the next thing, which is there was the pand pandemic and then with the police shootings and the killings that happened, the videos and the social media and the, the national protest. I was reading an article where uh, some a psychologist was saying that people need to turn it off. They shouldn't re-traumatize themselves over and over and over again by watching videos. And it was a discussion about secondary trauma. And I was wondering if you could both allude to that, which is here we are going through a pandemic. On top of that, you're seeing national protests on the media. You're, you're having re-triggered moments of racism. You're seeing police killings. What is that doing to us? And how can we offset that with where we are right now with such uncertainty about how the next week is gonna be, the next month, let alone to get to the end of the year? Well, in terms of um, working with youth, I'll, I'd say that one important thing is to not necessarily try to offset it uh, because it's happening. And so while definitely trying to, you know, minimize unnecessary um, exposure and things like that, um, or magnifying things um, as to be worse than they are, it's important to acknowledge to kids that this is happening and it's scary. And a lot of times I think adults tend to try to hide their emotions from kids or um, put on a happy face for kids. And that's actually um, not helpful because, you know, that's confusing. Kids are upset and they don't understand why their adults and their lives aren't um, if they're hiding it. So I think showing a developmentally appropriate emotion and also um, being clear about what the, the likelihood is. So, um, you know, that it's, it's definitely happening and it's not okay, but it's very unlikely to happen to someone you know. And the fact that it's more likely that, you know, something bad is going to happen to a black person than a white person is the problem. It's not that it's significantly likely to happen. And so that's one thing that I told some of my kids um, to put it into perspective um, about what really the problem is versus they need to be, you know, scared every second of the day. Mm -hmm. Dr. Alana, did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I think it's really important for us to recognize validation as a really important tool for getting through trauma. And what I mean by validation is instead of trying to tell the other person, uh, most of us, when we hear somebody say that they're upset or they're emotional, we, we want to help. And we think that helping is telling them to feel different or how they should feel or have to think about this other thing. But the first thing that you can do to help someone who's going through trauma or expressing that they're upset about something is to validate their perspective and to say, I at least ask enough questions to be able to say, I can understand why you feel that way about it. Um, and that, that, that requires us first to listen, to inquire about, okay, you're telling me that you're upset or you're telling me what you're upset about. Tell me what you are thinking. Tell me what you heard. Tell me where this is coming from. What did you watch? What are you, what are your questions? And then once you have a better sense uh, through empathy, that's engaging with empathy with the person, you can say simply to them, it's okay that you feel this way. I understand how you feel. It's okay to be sad or upset or scared or whatever it is that they're telling you. Don't stop there though, uh, because the next step is going to be um, understanding that uh, what, one thing that I teach people about is the amygdala. And the amygdala is the part of your brain that creates your emotions that you feel in terms of the sensations in your body. And it does that by translating what you think and what you're telling yourself about the situation. It will create the, the feeling, 
directly proportional to what you're telling yourself about it. So if you're telling yourself uh, the whole world's, you know, going to fall apart or that, you know, everything is terrible, we're never, this is never going to be over, uh, we never get through it, you will feel that uh, emotion that is consistent with that. Uh, as opposed to helping them back up and looking through things in a more descriptive and objective way of saying, yes, we are in the middle of a scary time. We know that, you know, we don't have these often, but we know that they've happened before in human history. And if we educate ourselves about coronavirus, if we educate ourselves truly about racism, if we educate ourselves about these pain points that we have as a society, Anytime you educate yourself about something, you feel more empowered to get through whatever the fear is of that thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what I encourage people to do is instead of um, instead of just leaving it as, uh, you know, telling them feel different or feel better. Right. Let's go dive into this and find out more about it and see if there are other answers. I did want to just briefly speak about turning off social media and news take social media breaks. Some people may not be able to do that because of their, um, their, uh, their careers may be related to their social media, but you can outsource some of that work and you still have to take regular breaks just to make sure that your mind is not constantly bombarded by negative things because what you put in your eyes and what you put in your ears directly translates to what you feel and how your brain is programmed to respond to things. So I encourage people to read their news instead of watch news segments you actually get more information anyway when you read and you get more objective information when you read from multiple sources to find out about a thing versus, you know, there's lots of videos and YouTube and lots of uh, people, experts who are giving a lot of information that actually is not based in science and not based in reality. So, you know, that's really important to, to read for yourself and find good, good sources of information that can back up their information with data. Oh, this has been, uh, <laughs> I wish we could go on. I mean, really feel like we need a, a full hour. No, I, I know it's not mm -hmm. enough time and you're both such amazing resources because I know so many people, everyone is going through something right now and we've just mm -hmm. chipped at a fraction of it. Uh, before we go to break, I'm going to put up the contact information for you on the screen. Uh, we have Dr. Alana. Uh, you can go to dralana.com or call 832-736-8326. And you're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then Dr. Carrie Lewis, licensed clinical psychologist uh, on Facebook. Uh, we've got that at facebook.com slash collaborative psych. Did I get that right? <laughs> and the number 314-341-0170. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about the whole reason we had this discussion is both doctors are presenting at Skills Over Pills, harnessing the power of neurobi neurobiology for the treatment of COVID-19 trauma and beyond. So we're going to get more details about that webinar, which is coming up. But thank you both so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll be right back after this short break.
there's nothing more powerful than imagination. But don't just imagine. Use STEM to change the world. Who's with me? Tomorrow. If she can stem, so can you. Find out more at She Can Stem. Here's your check. Oh, you, you got it. You know, since I got rid of my car, I really enjoy walking. Okay. Got it. Nope. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around ten thousand dollars in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom. That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Hi. You think you're probably sober? Yeah. But you're thinking about taking the back roads home just in case. Why would you do that? Probably OK isn't OK. Call a cab, a car, or a friend. Good choice. Selfie. <laughs> Nailed it. Hi, I'm Sarah Thompson, and welcome back to City Corner. I'm now joined by Monique Norfolk, who is the board chair of We Rise Up for Kids. Uh, we're going to be talking more details in this segment about the Skills Over Pills webinar that's coming up. And Monique, I have to ask you, in the first segment, I was interviewing Dr. Alana and Dr. Lewis, and now we get to the details of how did this all come about in the first place? Why did you choose uh, to, to present this webinar? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we really saw that there was a need when it comes to the trauma therapy that's provided in our St. Louis region um, to really be able to provide more of a therapy that goes deeper and looks at the comorbidities and the other factors that uh, youth may be experiencing and not just the one trauma that typically this more cookie cutter approach of therapy tends to focus on. Um, and with my own child, I will say, you know, she started the organization wanting to help other kids and families who experience trauma. And after a year and a half of being in trauma th um, therapy, she actually was about to be graduated and ended up being diagnosed with a severe mental illness. And so to have been in therapy for that long and realized that some of those comorbidities had not been identified and therefore were left untreated, as happens with many of our children. Um, was really a shocker for me. And so as a mom, as a public health professional, I didn't want other parents to have to go through this. And so we wanted to provide the training that mental health professionals need. That's really great. We should mention when I when I introduced you as board chair and you mentioned We Rise Up for Kids that your, your daughter who you just uh, mentioned started We Rise Up for Kids. Tell me a bit more about what the nonprofit does. Absolutely. So my daughter, Michaela Norfolk, is the actual founder and CEO of We Rise Up for Kids. So I get all of my direction from her. Um, <laughs> she's now 10, but she started the organization when she was eight as a result of bullying, which led to her experiencing some severe trauma that she's still dealing with um, even to this day. And her idea was to really make sure that kids had access to outlets that allowed them to have fun, forget the things that they were experiencing, and just really have a chance to enjoy life, which is what kids are thinking about. As her mother and a, a public health professional, knowing what it's like to navigate this mental health system, it's extremely challenging. I wanted to make sure that other parents and caregivers had access to mental health services and resources. And so when we would hold the events, we'd bring in providers like trauma therapists, um, legal services of Eastern Missouri, and um, many others just to make sure that parents knew what was available to them and had direct access. And so that's one aspect. And we just continue to evolve, honestly. Um, as we see the needs of the community, we evolve, we evolve. People can reach out to us for connections to resources. Um, we even are now providing financial support if people have a need for that for mental health services. Sometimes they have co-pays that they need to pay to meet their deductible and they can't. We don't want them to miss out on that. And so we're providing that support as well. I think with the webinar, I know this is, you mentioned to me that this will be the first webinar that we Rise Up for Kids is, is hosting, and Dr. Lewis and Dr. Alana were fantastic, and they're great. Is this something that is open to the public, or is it specifically for people who are in the mental health field, or teachers, or people who need the training? Because you can actually get credits from this webinar. Absolutely. Great question. Thank you. Yes. So this training, it was geared more towards mental health professionals, simply because we're focusing so much on the impact that COVID-19 has had 
on um, the mental health of our children. You know, and there's so many other things that are happening to kids, especially those who are living in areas um, that have just less access and have experienced more trauma traditionally. And so we wanted to make sure that while we already saw there was a shortage, now we know there's gonna be even more of a shortage of trained mental health professionals and more of a need. So we wanted to meet that need. However, while um, continuing education hours can be afforded to mental health professionals, this is definitely an appropriate training for anybody who is interacting with children. Like you said, teachers, that's amazingly um, important and that's something that we stress because when it comes to classroom management and all of that, if you don't understand where the trauma is coming from and how to help children overcome that, then that's where we see a lot of the behavioral issues and kids missing out on their academics and really just not getting the supports they need. But yes, this is professional development for any and everyone who works with children. Um, before we wrap things up, I, I wanted to know how with Michaela, with your daughter, Mickey, I know you call her uh, for short, have you talked to her? I mean, uh, was, when you sat down to go over the details of we're going to just have this webinar and it's going to talk about trauma and COVID-19, I mean, at her age, I mean, how was that discussion? I mean, how was she about moving forward with this webinar? So definitely, I mean, her goal is always to make sure that other people in our community have access to what they need. And so I know she was extremely supportive. She's definitely familiar with both of the presenters. And, um, you know, she felt extremely comfortable with it. She's been experiencing her own challenges with social isolation as of many children. And so to know that other kids are going to have access potentially to mental health providers that can provide the type of care that she's been able to receive. Um, that really made her happy. So that makes me feel good to do something I know she wants. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a, it, we're, we're all experiencing a lot. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of trauma with everything that is going on from the pandemic to the national protests. And I, I think this is really great. I really appreciated uh, talking to both uh, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Alana. So it's called Skills Over Pills, Harnessing the Power of Neurobiology for the Treatment of COVID-19 Trauma and Beyond. Uh, we're specifically looking at the August 18th date. And so tell people what happens. They go to your website, weriseupforkids.org. And slash that's where they can, slash webinar. Absolutely. And then there they are able to select the date and easily register. It takes about five minutes. Um, the cost is $175 per person. And for organizations like school districts, nonprofits, um, and otherwise, they register five or more people. It's $25 off per person and they can get their credits. Oh, that's fantastic. And people can reach out to you too. It's just a resource to learn if they have questions about this. Maybe they aren't able to do the webinar, but you might have some connections and resources. Absolutely. We definitely are always open to anyone reaching out to us if they need access to services, resources, support with funding on their mental health care, um, any of that. We are absolutely happy to support our community in any way we can. Well, thank you so much for your time. And thank you for putting together, you and Mickey putting together this uh, webinar. I know a lot of people are going to really benefit from the information that's shared uh, by Dr. Lewis and Dr. Alana. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching. And for more STLTV, head to our website, stltv.net and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And again, head to our website for any more information or questions. Take care.